Hello, good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to church. I'm so glad we have the kids here with, with us today. Can we get all the children to come to the front and worship along with us? Come on. Come on to the front. Heavenly Father, we raise our hands to you today as we give you our praise. I pray, O oh Lord God, that your presence come and fill this place. Come, Lord. Come in our presence. Come be with us today, O oh Lord God, in this wonderful Sunday. We thank you for everything you've done. We thank you for who we are in you.
Come on, church, why don't you just raise your hand and praise the Lord? Yes, why don't we worship Him this morning together as a church? Lord, you are the God, you are you are the great God. How great you are, how great you are, Lord, how magnificent you are. Church, we're just going to continue to worship in this atmosphere. You know, I just believe that this morning God is wanting to deposit something in our hearts. You know, if you came to, to church this morning with a need, Jesus wants to meet your need this morning. You know, I just sense that some of us need to understand the love of God this morning. We serve a great God and no matter where you are, no matter the circumstances, no matter the difficulties or the situations you may be facing, how many of you know that we serve a great God? His name is above every name. He's the name that is above every name. Every other name shall bow. You know, church, I just want you to continue to worship. We're not going to rush this. We're just going to spend time. We're going to linger in His presence. Amen. You are the name that is above every name. Lord, you are the name above depression. You are the name above sickness. You are the name above poverty. You are the name above challenges. You are the name above every other name, Lord. That at your name, sickness will flee. At your name, depression will flee. At your name, Lord, situations and confusion. Lord, there will be peace, Lord. And so, God, we just declare your name over every situation. We declare your name over every difficulty we say that you are the God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly we say Lord that you are the God that is able to break through for us you are the God of our breakthrough and so this morning Lord as we stand before you we just declare we acknowledge your Lordship over every situation Lord we acknowledge your not Lordship over this church Lord you are the God of this church Lord and together as a church we come together to worship you we worship the name above every name Lord and so God, we just thank you. We praise you for this amazing time of worship. We know that you are in our midst this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to do as you will. In Jesus' name, we all pray. 
Amen. Amen. Why don't you praise God this morning? He is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You know, why don't you just take your seats and let's remain in this atmosphere of worship. We're just going to go into communion. If we can just have the lights down a little, we're just going to transit into, into communion. Praise God. I'm just going to read to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is the verse where uh, it talks about communion. And uh, verse 23, it says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. On the night that He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God for it, and then He broke it into pieces saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, And in the same way, He took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and His people, an agreement confirmed with blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until He comes again. You know, church, as we enter into a series on community, you know, I want you to know that communion is one of the foundations, it's one of the bedrock of us coming together as a community you know and I just sense very strongly today that uh, several of us have come uh, either with a need or you desire to encounter God this morning you know I want you to know that there's power in communion you know when we eat the bread and we drink the cup and we declare the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ when we declare the new covenant in His blood there's so much power and so this morning I just want us to spend a couple of seconds uh, a, a minute or so let's just reflect let's allow the, the Holy Spirit to minister to us this morning as we take communion you know whatever needs you have come with there's power in the blood of Jesus Amen if you desire to have an encounter with Him the blood is an agreement of the new covenant that we have access to Jesus this morning. We have access to God this morning. Father, we just thank you for your blood. We thank you for your death on the cross. Lord, this morning, as we remember you, as we remember your death, Lord, we declare victory over every circumstance. Lord, we declare that though we may have felt far away, that because of your blood, because of the new covenant, today we can approach with bonus. Father, for those of us who need a breakthrough in our, in our spiritual walk, for those of us who desire to have an encounter with you, Lord, we are reminded that because of your finished work on the cross, because of the blood that has been shed, that we have access to you this morning. And so remind us of that. Father, we pray, Lord, that we will encounter you in a powerful, powerful way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you take the bread and drink the cup this morning. Jesus, once again, we just thank you for your body which was broken and your blood which was shed. Lord, that we can partake of the new covenant. We thank you for everything you have done for us as an individual and as a church. Lord, we just declare your lordship here this morning that we are your people and that you are our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, why don't you praise God this morning? He's a good God, amen. All right. Uh, welcome to church. Uh, once again, so good to see all of us here uh, on, on a Sunday morning. My name is Leon. I'm one of the leaders here and I'm your MC here this morning. 
so before we move on, I uh, just wonder if there's anyone who's joining us for the first time. If you're here for the first or second time, would you just give me a wave? Alright, we have a guest here in the middle at the front. Welcome, welcome to church. You know, we are so glad that you could join us here. Um, we do have a guest lounge that is outside. So after service, you know, we would like to welcome you to uh, just proceed to the guest, guest lounge and our staff and pastors would love to uh, get in touch and connect with you. Alright. Um, Alright. Uh, so, you know, uh, we'll just like to wait on you for this morning's offering. Uh, and so, if you would like uh, to give this morning, you know, we are happy to say that right now we do have a physical offering already. So, there's this ancient thing called the offering bag that will be passed around the house. And uh, so, just for those of us who have not seen it before, the offering bag it's not this white bowl that you see going around now, okay? Please don't put your offering into the white bowl. Uh. That is for your empty communion cups, okay? The offering bag is actually a, a literal bag, okay? So we are, we are just going to pass around the offering bags. If you would like to give electronically, okay, the QR codes for, for electronic giving is still available uh, on the church website. You can go to emmanuel.org.sg. Uh, the, the electronic giving QR codes will be on... Uh, on uh, in the church website, or you can also approach your cell leaders, and we will be able. We will be happy to make it available to you. All right. Uh, let's let me just pray for this morning's offering. Father, once again, we just want to thank you uh, for being such a good God. We want to thank you that uh, you are all that we need. You are you supply all our needs. You are Jehovah Jireh, and you provide for us. And so this morning, as we give to you, we give uh, out of a joyful heart. We give in obedience knowing that you are in control of all situations. So we bless the offering. We bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, as the offering bags are going around, you know, there are many exciting things that are happening in church. So let's watch the front as we screen church news. Hey church, welcome home. Here at Emmanuel, we believe that church is more than just a Sunday service. We are family and you have a place here. My name is Marcus and this is Church News. The Alpha Course is back and it's a great place for all who are curious about life, God and the Christian faith. Explore all these in an informal environment where you can ask questions without limits or judgment. It will be running both on-site and online starting from the 27th of August to the 26th of October, Wednesdays at 8pm. Only the first session on the 27th of August will be on a Saturday at 10am. If you know anyone who would benefit from the course or interested yourself, you can register via the link found on our church website. Family Life Ministry will be organising a Marriage Preparation Facilitators Training aimed at equipping participants with the understanding and ability to run a preparation course. If you're interested in championing others or learn how to build strong foundations yourself, you can sign up for the course happening on 27th August, Saturday 10am to 3pm at our UEC campus, Level 2 Classroom 0204. To register, you can do so via our church website. The Marriage of the Lamb is one of the greatest events prophesied in the Bible. But who is the Bride of Christ? Let us learn and explore from the scriptures as to how we, as the Bride of Christ, ought to live in preparation for the coming of our Bridegroom and King. Join Golden Emmanuel Ministry in their monthly service happening on the 20th of August, Saturday 2pm at the UEC campus, Level 3 Praise Hall. We will be having special guest speaker, Pastor Cynthia Oi, come share the word with us on the topic, The Prepared Bride of Christ, as well as having a special sing-along session with the Jam Ukulele group in the pre-service segment. It's a service you don't want to miss. With so much happening here at Emmanuel, you can keep up with us via our e-bulletin found on our church website, www.emmanuel.org.sg or follow us on our social media platforms for event updates and more. That's all we have for you. Have a great service. Alright, praise God. 
All right, so many exciting things. If you would like to keep up, you know, and you need to, you just couldn't digest all of that. Again, all the information is on our church website, emmanuel.org.sg, all right? Uh, just one announcement. Uh, if you have your communion cup still, you are welcome to dispose it outside uh, at the bin after service. I hope you did not put it into the offering bag. Uh, if you did, please see our pastor here at the front after service. Um, so uh, we would like to dismiss the children now. So children, thank you for joining us. Uh, you may now go for your classes. Uh, and while the children are making their way out, uh, we are in a series, a new series on uh, community college and, and it's a series about being a uh, community as a church, you know, and I, I think this is really a fantastic season to, to talk about this, you know, because the, the, the past number of years, uh, past two years, uh, the pandemic has actually divided us. It has uh, caused us to be further and further apart from one another. Uh, but how many of you know that God has called the church to come together, come together as a community, okay? And, and so to kick off this morning, uh, the first sermon of this series, would you help me to welcome my good friend and newly minted Associate Pastor, Pastor Elvin. Praise God. Thanks, Leon. Come on, church, let's give God a shout of praise in this place, amen, for all that He's done and He's continued to do in our church. Let's pray as we start today's uh, session on, on, uh, on the Word. Father, we just commit this time to your hands. God, we know that you are speaking to us. God, we know that you are doing something in our midst, not just in our church, but in our lives as well. Lord, we ask and pray and believe that, God, the best is yet to come. So, God, prepare our hearts, prepare our hands, prepare us for what you are about to bring into our lives. We pray that this uh, series uh, or this uh, uh, new sermon series is not just going to pass us by, but it's going to be something that you're speaking to us about and we can apply it. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Before I take a seat, give your neighbor a high five and say it's so good to see you here. Okay. We have quite a lot of people that have gone on over the long weekend, but it's great that you're here with us in church, okay? And it's such a privilege to share with you God's Word today, you know? And I'm sure that for all of us who've been coming over the past weeks and months, you will sense something different is happening in our church, you know, to not just at the altar time, but even within the cell groups, even within our Pentecost Wednesday prayer meeting, and even our CE class, we know that God is doing something. And, and we are on the verge of something great that is going to take place in our church and in our lives, you know. And I think Pastor Benny Ho last week, he talked about um, this thing called the 1972 revival. Uh, how many of you all have watched that video? <laughs> You're like, what, what 1972? <laughs> okay, I was born in 1972. No, no, not me. <laughs> Somebody was born. <laughs> okay. okay, there's this 1972 revival that, that uh, talks about um, the clock tower revival at ACS. talks about how 50 years, this is the 50th year since it has happened and how the fruits of that revival is still ongoing today. If you are in our uh, church Telegram channel, you have seen the YouTube link for both the English and Mandarin subtitles. And, and it's, it's really good. We watched it at our staff meeting on Monday. It's about 40, 40 over minutes. We thought, oh no, it's going to be a long video. But the 40 minutes went by really quickly because there's just such an expectancy of what God is doing now. Even if, if what God is doing now, what God has done then will carry on to what He's doing now as well. And maybe you hear this word revival a lot. Like, you know, it has comes up especially during this period of time from the 1st July to the 9th of August, our 40-day fasting and prayer. Whatever it is, right, I believe, right, that God is aligning our hearts to His today. Can you say amen to that? Okay, let's try again. Can you say amen to that? Oh, that's great. Okay, so the word revival right, can mean many things to us. Maybe you think about revival, you think about how long it lasts. Okay, is it like, like 1972? Is it like the Azusa Street revival? You think, okay, it's going to last maybe a year, a couple of years, 10 years, 20 years. Maybe we think, what does revival look like? You know, perhaps we've... Uh, I've grown up, you know, as a young person, going to national stadium, going to the indoor stadium, because we have rallies over there. I, I think you all remember uh, people like Carlos and Anaconda, Reinhard Bonke, they'll come to Singapore, you know, and everyone will gather, you know, in the stadium, and, and people will get safe over there. We think that revival may look like that. Or maybe revival, right, is in substance and content, you know, we're thinking, what does it really mean? What does it really entail of? And we think that maybe revival is like when people come to the altar, they respond dramatically, there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that's it, you know. And God, right, uh, whatever it looks like in our minds, right, God 
can cause us to have a different perspective or allow us to have a different experience of it. What I'm trying to say is that don't limit right, what you have experienced before then take that as the foundation and that's the box and say that God, you only can do uh, that now because I've experienced it like this. Revival really means it's different from what we have known, our routine, our what we're comfortable to. And God is saying that I'm going to change that up so that you can experience something new. You can some, experience something fresh, you know, in, in, in your life and the church, the life of our church. Last week, we had a couple of campus uh, people get baptized at East Coast Beach. Uh, it was really amazing because, those campus people, woo! <laughs> right, you know, we, it was really, really good. One of them, um, because we all have the name list, right? So one of them had five uh, pre-believer friends that came, a family and friends came. Then they had, in addition to the five, they had 20 <laughs> believers that came along for the baptism. So we're like, wow, that's uh, a lot of people <laughs> that is coming, you know, and they are not from campus, they are from uh, other places. So when we got to find out more about them and talk to them, I realized, right, they are students, right, from different uh, tertiary institutes, from the JCs, from the polys, you know, and they are part of this thing called uh, poly revival or prayer for schools. And we say, hey, how come you are here? They say, no, every time, you know, we are, uh, it's a bit like Campus Crusade, it's a bit like Scripture Union within the schools. Every time someone gets baptized, right, what they do is that all of them will come down to celebrate with them together, to, to cheer them on and to just uh, be with them. And I thought that was really interesting because it goes beyond the confine or the boundaries of my local church. Okay, you are my church member, then I can't support you. But you are a brother and sister in Christ, right, that is getting baptized, you're doing something great, I'm going to celebrate with you, I'm going to cheer you on. And we and after the baptism, I had a chance to interact with them. I, I just asked them, you know, hey, how's everything in the schools? I know it sounds like a very weird, oldish boomer question to ask, but I realized I'm reaching that, <laughs> that part where there's a, at least a 10 to 20 year gap between me and the students. So I had to ask them, you know, the recent developments in Singapore, you know, how are you coping with it? What is it like with your peers? And they will share honestly, say, you know, Pastor, there's a lot of things that's going on. Every time we try to speak up, to share our faith, right, we get pushed back, we get cancelled, we get um, destroyed, you know, and, and it's very difficult, we get persecuted. So the only way we can do, right, is to share our faith one-on-one -on -one with the people around, you know, and just help them to see that God is really loved and God doesn't hate anybody. The challenges that they face is very different from what we face in our time or what you have faced in your time as well. And, and we were talking about different, different challenges and they talk about, hey, you know, one of the things that, that we constantly face is this thing about uh, sexual purity. And they ask, how do you overcome it? So I just, I just share with them, you know, what, what are the things that we do. And then one of them just spoke and said that, you know, I believe, right, one of the ways that we can overcome um, this challenge that we face, right, is to keep our eyes on the vision or keep the eyes on what God has called us to be. It's not just what we are not doing, but it's also what we are doing as well and what we are seeing and what we want to be. And when I, when I interacted with them, right, I really thought, wow, that's what revival looks like. It's not confined to a church. It's not confined to a service. It's not confined to, oh, you have the praise and worship, then you feel the Holy Spirit coming. Nothing wrong with that. All those are good. Then you move. But even where we are, at East Coast Park without any background music or any pads going on the key of G. You know, then you feel like, oh, the presence of God is here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> without any of that, right? God, right, still moves. God is not confined by what our routine is or what we are used to. God can and will move before that. I want to show you a picture on the screen you know, and so what we did was that we said, hey, you know, I, I know I look overdressed for the beach. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not really. That. They were like, why you wear all black to the beach and wear shirts? shirt somehow? It just happens, okay? I'm, a, I'm like that. So we, I just said, you know, I want to pray for you guys. And I just prayed for them. And I said, hey, you know what? Can we pray for you as well? And they prayed for me. And one of them even released a word over me. I'm like, wow, this is great. This is what it should be like. That we are not afraid to follow God's leading God's prompting, God's direction in our life. We need to step out in faith. And maybe for some of you here, you're thinking, it's so scary. It's okay. The person receiving the prayer is also scared. You know? So it's all right. But you know, when you take that step of faith and say that, God, I'm going to listen to your prompting. I'm going to follow a direction. I'm going to pray for somebody. I'm going to listen. Maybe you want, God wants you to release your word. Do it. Because as you do it, you will see revival, the aligning of our hearts back to God take place once again. Amen. And when we look in the Bible, right, one of the earliest um, um, mention of, of revival is actually in the book of Acts. We see the Holy Spirit come, 
fell upon the believers, filled them, baptized them, right? Then uh, they, they really, uh, then Peter stood up and spoke, then there was salvation. In more than an event, we see how their lives completely changed as they turned from their old ways and turned to Jesus. So let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled in all, with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. And I believe right, that this is not just happen, that this will not just happen only in the book of Acts back then, but it will happen today. And it's not just about people added to the kingdom. Of course, that's the main thing, that's a great commission. But it's a lifestyle that as believers, we adopt, we change in line with the word of God. You know, and, and like what Leon said, you know, it's so apt that we have this new series in the midst of this. This new series gives us handles on what to do, how to do when God starts to send revival in our midst. Okay? And this series is called Community College and we look, uh, take a focus on the fellowship of believers. The great commission, right, is the church most important mission. The church can only accomplish that when it is the church in a community of believers. It's not just individuals living their own lives, but as a community, we live our lives together for Jesus, right? That's when the church begins to fulfill and to pass on the Great Commission. God has chosen to reach the world through the community of believers called the church. The church, right, is not just an organization structure. It's not just an org chart, but it is God's divine blueprint, right, for the building of the disciples of Jesus. And we see that through the early church in Acts 2 as we, as we read. And in and this community, uh, sorry, this community college series is going to last for three weeks, okay? And each of the week, right, we're going to have what we call take-home assignments, okay? Turn to your neighbor and give them a smile <laughs> and say, time to do homework. <laughs> okay, la, not homework. La. It's more, more of a call to action, okay? It's something that we want to practice to get to the, together as a church, as a, as a cell group, okay? So over the next three weeks, I strongly encourage and urge you, brethren and sisteren, okay, to follow what we have wrote uh, for this community series, you know, and, and, and there will be handles that we can follow and things that we can do as well. And we want to talk today, right, how do we love one another? Love is very, uh, it can be something that, that is, seems like it's only emotion, but love, right, is also a decision that, can, uh, that we need to make as well. And community or our presence in our community, right, also reveals, right, whether we truly love God or it is a nice statement on the wall. Because you say, wow, love one another, right? We can have that on our church wall. We can paint that all over the church building. Next time we paint our church building, maybe red color. I don't know. You know? We can paint it everywhere. But how it's more than just a word, right? Or a slogan, right? It's when we begin to live it out in our lives today. The first church in Acts 2 didn't just say they loved one another. They, but they prove it by the actions of meeting together and to the point of sacrificing their own material comfort for those who had need. Okay? And beyond the community of believers, the church is called to reach the world. And it starts by the way we live our lives as a witness through our community. Our community should have such a radical love that others know that there is a God who loves. If we love each other as Jesus loved us, then the world will know that we follow Jesus. Amen. And ultimately, the church community doesn't exist to just be a happy social circle. It's nice, but it's not just a happy social circle, but to show the world a better way to live life in love, in community, in relationship with God who loves them deeply. Okay? And so today, the passage we want to focus on is in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. Okay? It says this, A new command I give you, love one another. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you. Okay, maybe... Uh, <laughs> oops. Well, <laughs> some of you are taking this opportunity to make friends. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let me know how it goes. <laughs> uh, it carry on. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love 
one another. And today we want to unpack these two verses into three points so that we have practical handles on what it means to love one another, what it means to be in a community, what it means to receive what God is going to put into our lives. Of course, John 13 to 17 is called the farewell discourse. Basically, it's the last four hours on Thursday night before Good Friday. It's the last words of Jesus. So the last words of anybody is very important. So Jesus is essentially saying, before he goes to the cross, these are the things that you as my disciples, you must not only hear, but you must do as well. Okay? So how do you love one another? Number one, very quickly, love one another, right? Uh, it is a command. We look in uh, verse 34. It says that a new command I give you, love one another. Can you imagine, right? Jesus is with them. He's talking. He's just hanging out with them. And then suddenly he turns to them and says that I give you a new command. Love one another. It sounds like very out of the blue. And it's like, eh, why Jesus would give a new command? But actually, right, if you look at this, this thing called love one another, right, it's not something that only uh, was spoken in the Gospels. And then Jesus also said that he didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill the law, right? So actually, if you look in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it says that, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, New King James, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So it's not something new. The disciples of Jesus already know this because they memorized the first five books or, 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 the, or what we call the Torah. It is part of their lives. You know? But then why did Jesus have to say, a new command, I love you? It doesn't make sense. If they know, it's not new. You know? But when we look deep into the text right, and we understand it further, right, the word new right, doesn't mean recent. It doesn't mean different. The word new is the, it implies freshness. So what Jesus is saying that a fresh command I'm giving to you again. Love one another. Okay? It wasn't that this commandment was just invented. It's just that it will be implied, uh, presented in a fresh, new way. Okay? And before he told them, right, actually what happened is that when the disciples came to the home, what did he do? He, he was the one who brought himself to the level of servant, right? And he began to wash their feet as they came into the home. You know, and that's, that's what servants do. And after that, he tells them to imitate his servanthood. So what he, is he saying is that, look, I have shown you what it's like to love one another by being the lowest, by being the servant. Now, therefore, take this fresh perspective and begin to love one another. And when we look at the Jewish uh, religious life in the first century, right, we will realize right, there wasn't a lot of love going around. The Jewish people right, were divided into different groups, into different uh, thinkings and perspectives. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Zealots, on and on. God's people were greatly divided. And when we look at their lifestyle and the way that they were living, we can see why Jesus tells them, hey, a new commandment, a fresh perspective I give to you, begin to love one another. Why? Because, you see, in their land at that time, they were occupied by the Romans, right? And in technically speaking, right, the Romans are foreigners in their land. Of course, the Romans weren't very kind to them, you know, they were oppressing them, you know, they were just uh, making life miserable for them. But we look in the law that God has given to the Jewish people is that you are to treat the aliens or whether the people are foreigners with love and respect and to take care of them. It did not come with a condition. Only if they don't oppress you, then you love them. Only if they don't beat you, then you love them. We say that you are to treat them even though uh, if, if they are a foreigner in your land. So they weren't loving the foreigners in the land. They mostly hated the Romans. They didn't love the neighbours as themselves. You know, actually, if you read the history, Jews despised their neighbours to the north. To the north is who? The Samaritans. You know, we read in the, in the story of the Good Samaritan and how people just walk past the person or the woman at the well as well. You know, they did not love the neighbours and themselves. They were greatly divided over the issues of practice. You're thinking, how much effort can you expend to get your ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath? How many paces, how many steps can you walk on the Sabbath without it being considered work? They were looking at the technicalities of things. They were more concerned with themselves than with the other person. So simply speaking, they did not love one another and they needed this new commandment, this fresh commandment from God again. You know, and Jesus knew that very shortly after this, the church will be birthed upon the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so he reminds and he calls his disciples back to the basics that if we cannot love one another, then we cannot love God. We cannot love our neighbours. We cannot love the foreigners in our lands. We cannot love our enemies as we should. 
And what Jesus is saying is that love is more than just a feeling. It is a commitment and it can remain as fresh as we want it to be. Love is not a routine. It's not a program. It's not a matter of circumstance or convenience. Love goes out of the way, steps out of our comfort zone to do what is right in the Lord's eyes. If you think about it today, right? Uh, most of us come to church uh, on site or whether online. So if you come to church every week, whether on site or online, right? And then you attend cell group every week, whether it's Pentecost or fellowship or, you know, just cell sharing. If you go for CE classes, if randomly someone sends you a YouTube video to watch, you know, on average, right? Every year you will listen to God's word at least 100 times. 52 weeks in a year, right? You know, at least 100 times, okay? That's in addition to your uh, daily devotion, you know, your discussions you have outside a formal setting, you know? And the things that we respond to, right, may not always be a new thing that we heard. If you are in church for at least, you know, 10 years, 20 years, the messages, the passages that we use, right, is not in a bad way, it's recycled because the Word of God is the same. You know, it doesn't, we don't add on every year, oh, I feel like there's a book of, you know, the, 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 after Revelation, is manipulation, I don't know, <laughs> other books. You know, just add in, add in, add in. It doesn't work that way because it is fixed. The 66 books is like that. So you will hear the verses over and over and over again. And nothing wrong with that. We should because we let the Word of God comes into our life and take root in our heart and transform us, right? But there are moments, right, when we can hear this verse, maybe last year at this time, but this year we hear this verse, then we're like, wow, that's such a revelation. That's something that's so different because there's a freshness that comes into our hearts and into our lives. And we're like, wow, God, Thank you for revealing it to me. Thank you for letting me know uh, this is what your word says. You know? And God, right, Jesus is reminding us today, right, that the love that we have, right, is like that. It needs to be fresh, it needs to be anew, it, not, it does not need to be stale. And how do we do that? Is when we begin to spend time in the presence of God. The disciples knew it from reading Leviticus or the Torah, but they had it as a revelation when they spent time and they interacted with Jesus and Jesus spoke to them. And so maybe today, you know, you're thinking, wow, my spiritual walk is okay. It's a bit dry. You know, it's not like where I want it to be. Maybe you can spend a bit more time in the presence of God, not just asking Him for what He can do, but simply seeking Him for who He is today, you know. And why is it so important for us to do that? Because we cannot give what we do not have. Our love cannot be fresh when we do not spend enough time in the presence of God, fresh time in the presence of God. We cannot give out stale, tired love. It must be love that comes from God. And how do we love one another? It's the extension of our relationship with Jesus today. It is through a connection with the Holy Spirit. We see that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, you know, and there was a freshness, there was a direction given to them. They were radically transformed to live a totally different lifestyle. And just as how revival starts with the presence of God, loving one another, you know, building this community, you know, and, and just letting God uh, do something in our lives and the lives of our church starts with the presence of God. Revival is not simply what God can do through you, it's what He can do in you first that matters. Loving others is not just what you can do for another person, it's what you allow God to do in you first that truly matters. Amen. Francis Chan says this, Would you say that your life is characterized by love? Love for God. Love for the people around you. Or is there something else that drives you? We'll probably all be quick to affirm that we love God and love the people around us. But how many of us could really say that we are driven by love? I suppose love would be easy if we could define it any way we like. But the heart of biblical concept of love is a God who demonstrated His love by making the supreme sacrifice. God shows His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. When you put it like that, love does seem too easy. Add to, uh, uh, add to that Jesus statement in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Clearly, love is far more important, far less fluffy, and far more involved than we tend to think. It's adop adopted from his book, um, Crazy Love. And how do we love one another? It is not just a command, not just a revelation. It's not just a freshness that the Lord brings into life. It is also through the example that Jesus has shown us today. Amen. We look at point number two quickly. It says, love one another. It is an example. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Okay, the word S-A-S, you know, is, is very straightforward. It just means in the same manner. You know, Jesus is saying, in the same way, I have loved you, love one another. 
in the same um, uh, um, steps that I've taken, take it for one another as well. You know, parents, when you teach your children something, right, you will often demonstrate to them first before uh, you allow them to do it on their own, right? Or you want them to do it together with you. Because we know verbally there's only so much anyone can understand. But when there's a demonstration, when there's an act, when there's like, oh, this is what it looks like, right? Then the other person is able, right, to catch onto it and to do exactly what you have shown to them, you know? You demonstrate yourself and then say, now you do it just as uh, like I did it. And this is what Jesus is saying to us. He says, I've shown you now how to love. Now you love others the way that I do. And that's really, if you think about it, it's really huge, you know. Because we think Jesus, right, is just God, <laughs> fully God. But we forget right, that Jesus is fully God and fully man as well. It means the emotions, the struggles that we experience, right, he also experienced. Yet, in the midst of what he is facing, what is uh, maybe against him, he still chooses to love the people. Then you're thinking, so does it mean I can flip the table in the church because Jesus flipped <laughs> the table in the temple courts because that is what love looks like? No. <laughs> okay. What Jesus was trying to do was to tell them that you cannot love God and try to make money out of loving God. Okay? you got to look at the example of what Jesus is doing, pick out and ask yourself, can you do it? Sorry, can you do it not just by your own strength, but can you do it by how Jesus is able to give you the grace and the power to do so? You see, uh, so a sub point, what, about, what is Jesus' love about? First, that is that Jesus' love right, is undeniable. When Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, the Jews said, Behold how he loved him. The Bible says Jesus looked at the rich young ruler even as he walked away from following Jesus. We read that Jesus loved him. Jesus provided concrete examples day after day that he loved people in his teachings, in his miracles, his healings, his acts of service. Can we say that our love right, is undeniable just as Jesus' love is undeniable? Maybe we can say that. We can say, yeah, you know, I, I have undeniable love for my family or for my very good friends or for the people who have walked me through the mountains and the valleys of life. You know? But the Word of God is not telling us to love those people only. Because if you love them, what good is that to you? As the Bible says, when you love your enemies, then you show that is the real love of Jesus, right? You know, can we say that in our lives, we have an undeniable love of God for not just people we are comfortable with, that we accept, but for everyone within the community and the body of Christ? That's something to think about. Because <laughs> you're thinking, oh no, I don't love the person on my left and right. <laughs> Let that not be our spouse. But, you know, you're thinking, oh no, <laughs> this is very hard. Or, you know, oh, I have this person that I see in church, right? That when I see them, right, I'll walk to the other aisle, you know? Or I'll go and say hi to somebody else. Maybe that's what the Lord is trying to work in you today. Take that step. You talk about Jesus' love, right? It is good, it's comforting, it is very nice. But Jesus' love, right, is also in a good way confrontational because it forces us to re-examine re what's in our hearts, really. So let's say uh, we talk about our love for each other in community, right? You know, think about a carousel meeting, you know, when you come for cell group, you know, everybody comes and they just hang out, fellowship, they eat dinner, they eat lunch, whatever it is, you know. And, and somebody asks, hey, uh, where is this person, uh, A, B, C? And then sometimes you will notice, right, everybody just looks to the cell leader and expects the cell leader to know all the answers, you know. Not just where ABC is, but what ABC is going through at that moment in time, you know. Their struggles, their challenges, you know. But is it supposed to be only the cell leader needs to know? Or is it upon the whole community to just find out and to show care and concern, you know? Are the cell leaders the only one to follow up if the person does not come? Or is it the call to all? Because if we call ourselves a spiritual community, right, then our community does not subcontract the caring to one person but all of us begin to care for one another. Can you imagine, right, in your cell group, right, if one person doesn't come and the whole cell, out of their own initiative, right, decides to message that one person and say, hey, how come never see you today? Are you okay? If your cell group is 20 people, 19 people message that one person, how do you think that person will feel? How do you think you'll feel? He'll be like, wow, I cannot judge, you know, I look out, you know. Or you're thinking, wow, the love from this community is undeniable, you know. It's really, they really care for me. Then, of course, then you have to reply to the cell WhatsApp group chat. Okay, guys, I'm alive, I'm alive you know, I'm not dead, you know, I just happen to be sick or whatever, you know. Can we do that today? Because the love 
Jesus' love, right, is so undeniable that people can feel it. They can say, wow, this is really something that God is doing. You know, number two, uh, sub-point quickly is that Jesus' love, right, is selfless. He taught us to give expecting nothing in return. He taught us to give without blowing a horn or even letting our right hand know what the left is doing. And Jesus practiced that kind of love and gave, you know, so much to many people. Can we love and give without expectation back in return? It is quite difficult because sometimes when we give, subconsciously or maybe we have an agenda, we hope that, you know, as I scratch your back, you scratch my back. <laughs> but it's not like that with Jesus. He gave self, uh, selflessly, you know. Okay? And, and, and we see that in our church a lot. Uh, there's this uncle, you know, from, uh, I call uncle, okay? <laughs> uncle from uh, Auntie Jenny, Uncle Joel's cell group that will fetch Pastor Kume every Sunday to church and every Sunday back home as well after church service. Selfless. What can you expect out from her in a, in, in a sense? But he still does it because he wants to honour his pastor. More than that, he wants to show love to a sister in Christ, you know? And can we begin to do that thing and ask ourselves, is there somebody that I can show Jesus selfless love to today? It may be within your cell group, you know, you got a carpool to come or you hear of somebody or a child, you know, that wants to come for children's ministry but, you know, they are staying in Pongo and nobody can send them but you are staying in Pongo or Sengkang, you say that, you know what, I'm going to answer that call and send that child to church every Sunday, you know, and bring that child for lunch and then adopt that child into the spiritual family and one day his or her parents also will be saved. Can we begin to have that kind of selfless love that Jesus has? It is difficult. It can be challenging. It is long drawn. It needs to be consistent. But it's necessary because that is what the Lord is telling us to do today. Okay? Number three, sub point quickly is that Jesus' love, right, is unconditional. When we look at Jesus, we see a picture of unconditional um, love. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved love the world that gave His one and only Son. And we read in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, He says that while we are still yet sinners, Christ died for us. If on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being really unconditional, one is that you are conditional or you know you have a lot of hidden agenda. How would you rate yourself on unconditional love today for others? I don't need to raise your hands or show me, okay? <laughs> I'm not judging anybody today. If you know you're like in the middle, you, then maybe it's based on circumstances. Okay, I will be I'll help this person if circumstances allow, or if you know uh, this person can do it for me. If you're closer below five, then maybe it's something for you to ask the Lord to help you through because it's not that sometimes you don't want to do it, but it can be difficult. We are not just grappling with giving, but we are grappling with our being as well, our identity, our struggles. Maybe we have given before and we've been hurt and therefore we think that it's not worth to love another person again. But if you are, you know, from 5 onwards all the way to 10, maybe I can just encourage you to just continue to do it and to bring others along the journey. As what we learned just now, you know, there's an example needed. Maybe because some of us want to show unconditional love, but we don't know how. But when we see someone begin to do it, then we learn. You know, and say that, okay, this is what it means to love somebody. One of the things that I'm learning to do even more, you know, uh, in this season is learning to do a lot more visitations. So what I'll do is that I'll ask Pastor Raymond, hey, you know, every two, three weeks, who are you going to visit? I'm going to come along with you. I want to learn what it means to love. I want to learn what it means to continue to pour out uh, what God wants His people to know, not just in the church, but in the homes as well. I take that step because I want to develop the unconditional love for God and for others. And I wonder what are the steps that we can all develop together, you know, as a church, as a community, as a body of Christ to say that we want to show the love of Jesus to others around, okay? Are we willing to love others in church even if they have never done anything for you or will ever do anything for you? That's something for us to ponder upon. You know, are you willing to celebrate another person's achievement? So for example, you know, you, you, you're, you're working really hard, you know, but somehow due to a company restructuring, either you were sidelined for a promotion or you were let go. And then at cell group, somebody said, wow, praise God, you know, wow, I got increment, I got a three months bonus, you know, and, and you know, I got promoted. What's your response? What's your reaction? 
Would you just be like, yeah, that's great for you. Then you wallow in your, the things that you face. Or you say, you know what? I want to show unconditional love to this person. Let me celebrate with them their achievement because we are one body of Christ. If one is happy, we will be happy together. We will celebrate together. Can we begin to do that in our church? Can we begin to do that in our lives today? Amen. You know, Jesus calls us to unconditional love when we put up uh, with the idiosyncrasies of others. Okay? Everyone know this word, kwan or not? You know this word quan, right? It's like, you know, the, the, the language of Singapore is so powerful. Right? You say one word, everybody know what it means. Like, lay la law. So if I say quan, right, you all know everyone got quan. Okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, you also got quan. <laughs> In a nice way, okay? Don't scold them. This is not a time to scold them. <laughs> you say, you want quan like this this morning, you do this to me. <laughs> okay? This is not the appropriate moment. If you want to come to the altar, there will be reconciliation later in prayer. <laughs> okay? Everyone got quan. Everyone got preference. Everyone got a certain way that they want to do things. It's normal. I also have my con. I also have a certain way that I like to do things. You ask Michelle, you know, I like a certain way. Then it goes out of sync there, like, you know, like the body malfunction a bit. <laughs> but even though we all have con, we love anyway. Because that what, that's what Jesus would do and that's what Jesus has shown us and that's what Jesus commands us to do. If everyone is the same, life is boring. But the beauty of it is that everyone is different, you know. Are we willing to put up in a good way the idiosyncrasies, the quant of different people and say, I'm going to love you anyway, you know. Are we willing to spend time with people who, you know, who are, I wrote down here, aren't the most beautiful people who do not have so much rank on their uniforms or don't have much resources to share? Are we selective with the people that we love today? Do we hang out with those uh, that have something to give to us or only those that help us to advance you know, in our career or in our life? Think about it. You know, it makes a lot of difference because we should not pick and choose who we want to hang out with. We must always hang out and, and be open to everyone who comes across our lives. Okay? Do we love our enemies? Someone who has done or said something hurtful to you. It's easy to love those who are kind to you. It's difficult to love those who have offended you, have hurt you. Have I hurt people, offended people? Yes, I also have. If I've hurt you and offended you today, I'm really sorry. You know, I'm a work in progress. I'm still growing, you know, and, and God is doing a work in me. I hope you find it in your heart to forgive me. And I, I pray that, you know, when we have people that have hurt us and offended us, we will not hold that offense or hurt, but we will love them as how Jesus loved them with the unconditional love, you know. Are, we, are you willing to be friends with someone who has hurt you or will you just avoid them, especially within your community? Sometimes you will think that, you know, if this person comes for a cell group, then I don't want to come for a cell group. <laughs> you know, if this person comes to church, I don't want to come to church. Come on, you know, the, the body of Christ is so much bigger than the hurt of offense, you know. And especially if you know person A and person B got issue, right, and you are person C, right, don't stand by and like, oh, wow, they got issue, and then tell everybody about it. Be the person that reconciles them and say, hey, we know there's an issue. Let's sit down together as a body of Christ. Let's talk it through. Let's work it out together. Let's not allow the hurt and offense to fester because that's when the devil has a foothold. But we don't want him to have a foothold. What, he, what we want him to do is to get out and we want the body of Christ to be built up together. Amen. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are a peacemaker today. <laughs> You're like, no, I don't want to be a peacemaker. <laughs> but the Bible says, blessed are those who are peacemakers. Okay? Jesus spent time, ate together, he cried together, he celebrated together. Jesus has shown us what it means to do life in the community. This is something that we need to follow. As he has done it, we must do it as well. Sometimes we think our spiritual community is only limited to the cell group gatherings or to the Sunday services. But maybe you want to consider that your spiritual community is outside of these two formal settings. One of the take-home assignments for this week's series, okay? It says this, to spend time with your cell members outside of cell time and Sunday services, okay? Learn to ask questions, not interrogate, okay? Learn to ask questions, learn to share openly, vulnerably, and wisely as well. Maybe this week you should ask your, one of your cell group members, would you like to hang out? Let's go and watch a movie, uh, what else can you do? Let's go and eat at East Coast Park. Unless, okay, no, I think that could go wrong. But yeah, uh, let's go and visit somebody together. Let's go and play Mobile Legends together. Uh, let's go and someone say Amen. Is it? No. So, let's go and clean up the church together. Okay, now it's pushing it already. Okay, All right. The toilet sometimes a bit dirty. Okay. 
let's go and do something together. Or maybe let's go and have coffee together. You know, I know this great coffee place. You know, somehow all these people say, have you heard of this great food place? That great food place. I'm like, how do you know all this? You know, there's so much life experience eating. Let's go and have coffee together. Let's talk about life. Okay, maybe, maybe you say, okay, let's talk about life. Then you have coffee, the person, sit down the person. Then awkward silence. <laughs> because it's like this is the first time you're talking to the person. I mean, alone, one-on-one, and not in a group, right? You can ask questions. Lah, you know, I don't assume... Uh, the person knows everything or you know everything about the person. Ask, you know, how's their job? How's their family? You know, ask them what's their um, uh, greatest, what's their greatest achievement, you know? Or search on the internet. Icebreaker questions to ask one another, you know? As you begin to do that, right? Take that step, right? You will really get to know one another better. It's okay one. Sometimes I Google how to do team building activities then I execute the stuff, you know? It's normal. Don't worry. The internet is there for us to use, okay? But don't do it in front of the person. Like, hey, wait, ah. Huh? How to make small talk? Hmm. How are you today? Oh, good. Ah. Okay. Eat ready? Oh, you eating now? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense, okay? So prepare, you know. Be intentional with the gathering, with the meeting. Build your community together, you know. I'm sure Jesus, right, before he, he, he hung out with his disciples, he thought about it. He didn't like, oh, just let the Spirit of God lead me. You know, I'm sure he thought about it and he was very intentional, even with his lessons about washing the feet, you know, even with his, his demonstration of healing, he was intentional about it. So if our community, we also must be intentional plan something, okay? Do something. Step out of your comfort zone, okay? Very quickly, point number three, love one another. It is a declaration. We look at it. It says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How do we show that we are God's disciples? Disciples of Christ is when we begin to love one another. We are called to be set apart. We are not called to tear apart, amen? We are called to set apart different from the world. We are not called to be like the world, to tear people down and to bring them to know wherever they should not be going, you know. Christ is glorified when believers love one another, you know. There's this Christian philosopher called Francis who said, not Francis, another one who said this, the world has a right to judge Christianity by the way we treat each other as Christians. Love is the ultimate apologetic for Christianity. Amen. The world has a right to judge Christianity by the way we treat each other as Christians. Love is the ultimate apologetic for Christianity. The way we interact with each other as believers, right? It is a demonstration to the world of how Jesus loved. It's like, it's such a tall order, but it's possible because God has empowered us to do so. And it is, if you're wondering why the people around you may not be getting safe, then maybe can I ask you, is it the way you live your life? Is it the way you talk about your church? The way you talk about yourself, talk about the pastor? Maybe you've got some pastors, you don't agree with their, their teachings. It's okay. We all have our perspective. But it doesn't mean we go and talk to a pre believer and say, hey, you know what, uh, this pastor, uh, I want to talk, uh, you know, so, so much grace, you know, so much love. It doesn't make sense. What you're doing is that you're pushing that person away from Jesus because the person doesn't understand what you're saying. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we treat each other as Christians, you know? The love we demonstrate uh, towards one another will serve as a barometer of our witness in the world. It sounds nice, but it's not always easy to live out. Okay, there's an expression that says, to live with the saints in heaven, oh, that will be glory. But to live with the saints on earth, that will quite be another story. Okay, but believe, uh, remember that Jesus does not say that we have to have, always have to have good feelings about each other. We don't always have to like each other, but he did say we need to love one another. Okay, when we put us out, put aside our feelings, likes and dislikes and seek the best of each other in true Christian love, we will make an impact around uh, those that are around us. When they see love act out in our relationship and our interaction with one another, their lives will be impacted for the gospel. Because ultimately, our mission on earth is not to stay in this church until Jesus comes. It's not just to meet weekly, have fellowship, tickle our ears, stick our bags, you know, like, wow, this is great until Jesus comes. But our mission on earth is to bring the gospel to people. And one of the ways we can do it is when we begin to love one another. Jesus will mark us as disciples by our love for one another. We can mark ourselves as his disciples by our love for one another. The world can mark us as his disciples by our love for one another. Very clearly, if you have love for one another, you are a disciple of Christ. 
Sometimes we think, oh, disciples of Christ, you know, we need more classes. Yes, we need more theological training, we need more biblical understanding, we need more teachings, that's necessary. But being a disciple of Christ means that there's an action, there is an application that needs to be done because we need to love one another. The church, right, is the only organization, right, that exists for non members. Okay, let us sing in, huh? The church is the only organization that exists for non members. We are not here to have a membership and, like, wow, we are very happy. We are here existing. Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we plan, we strategize our plans for the next year, you know, our budgeting, our appointments, you know, our, our adjusting, refining, is for non members of the church. That means for people who do not know Jesus. And when we begin to understand that and internalize that, right, sharing the gospel with somebody, right, is no longer something that is left only to the pastor, only to the leader, only to the evangelist, only to someone that's on fire. But you realize that that is your commission. That is your call as a church, as a believer of Christ today. The great commission is fulfilled when we begin to make disciples. And how do we make disciples? When we begin to love one another through God's love and grace and in His ways. Revival starts with love for God and love for one another. The fruit of revival is when we begin to have selfless and unconditional love in our love for God and for one another. Deciding that our lives is not just for ourselves, but is what God has, been give, has given to us and our life is what we must give back to God today. And as we love one another, we must begin to make room for one another as well. A circle that is very close can be very exclusive. A circle needs to bring in people, you know, multiply into many other circles so that people on the outside will continue to be brought into our spiritual community to be connected with the love of Jesus. As we continue to receive and be in the process of revival, whatever that means to us here, we need to love one another. We need a fresh revelation of what love is like. We need to study the scripture and ask God to reveal to us how to love. We need to let our love for one another be an evangelistic a, a demonstration and outreach to others. Love for one another requires space. Not from the other person, but for the other person. Have we become so packed in our lives that we have not made space for people. That we have not made space for God. You know, uh, I don't know about you, I use Google Calendar and Google Calendar, my Google Calendar has a lot of things, a lot of meetings, a lot of reminders and people's names as well. Sometimes I'm guilty of like making people just an item on a Google Calendar and say that, okay, I need to meet maybe Leon you know, and just put Leon one hour, but actually bluff one, it's always two hours, you know, or hang out with a few people one hour, but actually it's four or five hours, you know. It's easy to make people just an item in a calendar, but I don't believe that's what God is telling us today. He's telling us we need to make space for people in our lives to bring them into our community, our spiritual community. But more importantly, more than just people, do we make space for God in our lives today? Or are we so packed up that we forget, hey, God, uh, maybe your calendar item on Sunday morning, or your calendar item on Wednesday or Friday during cell group. Or oh, once in a while, I push you into my Thursday night for CE class. God, it's a calendar. Or you come for next week, coffee talk, you know, Saturday. God is limited to calendar. He's limited to blocks. But actually, God should be given your entire calendar and say that God, and, say, and then you say to God, what would you want me to do with it? You know? The Lord is asking us today, will we make room for Him as we lean into revival, as we lean into loving one another? This thing about community college cannot just be a teaching. It has to be something that we lift out today. But maybe for some of us here today, we need the encounter with God, the freshness, so that we have the love to pour out to other people. Maybe some of us need to have that make, do business with God and say that, God, I've been hurt by this person, but I don't want to hold on to this hurt anymore. I want to let it go because I want to live a life worthy of your call. I want to live a life full of love for one another, for the other person. Maybe you are saying, oh, I, I, I don't know how to do it. God, won't you teach me how to do it? And you see that the Lord will prompt you and guide you in how we can love one another today. As the worship team comes up, you know, and as we uh, put away the things, I just want to close uh, really quickly, you know, and challenge us, you know, will we make room for the Lord today in our lives? You know, will we make room for Him? 
will we say that God, come and fill us. Come and maybe remove our agendas on our calendar. Move this, move that, because God is all about you. You think about it, if somebody brings something into your house, you know, and they say, you know, I want to give you a new TV, you won't put the new TV in front of the old TV, right? You will take the old TV and move it away, put it somewhere else, throw it, give it to somebody, whatever, and then you put a new TV there. But a lot of times in our lives, right, we are, God gives us something new, but we still hold on to something old. And say, God, uh, I want to have both. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to just do it uh, your way. I want to do it my way and your way. We know that it doesn't work because there will be disunity, there will be such dis- disparity within our spirit and within our soul. You know, today I want to ask us, do we or will we make room for the Lord? You know, we don't just want to fit the Lord into our lives, but to let Him do whatever He wants to do. Making room in our lives for the Lord will look differently for each of us but it is necessary to do so. We make room by listening and leaning towards the Holy Spirit. In the, in the last passage for today, it says John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. Amen. And in the Community College Sermon Series, How do we love one another today? We need the voice of the teacher. In this case, the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us. We need the Holy Spirit to give us freshness in loving one another, to give us revelation of how Jesus loved and how we can continue to love one another so that we can be witness and disciples, a caring family church that connects people with the love of Jesus. We make room by letting the Holy Spirit teach us all things. Are we open today or are we stuck in our ways? Tradition doesn't always equate transformation. Maybe you're used to your life being a certain way, a certain routine, a certain boundary, a certain up and down, you know. Maybe. But maybe the Holy Spirit is saying that, hey, it's time to shift some of your routines. It's time to shift some of your boundaries. Uh, I was telling the cell leaders, uh, I was on today, uh, this week, you know, and we always talk about, you know, coming back on site. Then we get a bit triggered, like, hey, you know, why, the church, why does the church always, uh, can we just play something in the background? <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Can we just play something? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, we stand, stand on there two minutes now, like, you got sound up. No sound. Okay, got sound up. No sound. Got sound. <laughs> can we just play something? Or can we have the sound on as well? <laughs> Sorry, so these are the things that we try to work out, you know, on the service level. So to be honest, you know, I was just telling the cell leaders this week, you know, I said, hey, you know, whenever we talk about, whenever we talk about coming back on site, you know, we, we get a bit triggered because we feel like that when the church calls us to come back on site, it's as if the church is enroaching into our private space. You know, and, and the church, you know, you don't understand. It's very, it's very unsafe. You know, I could catch COVID, you know, and understandably so, really understandably so. You know, to understand, it's very difficult, the routine, you know, the children are used to it, you know, I'm used to it. I, I, I want to do this. Yes, we understand. But the community cannot believe online. <laughs> the community cannot believe in messages. <laughs> the community cannot believe over a Telegram video message. It doesn't work that way. The community cannot believe over likes on Facebook or Instagram, you know, it doesn't work that way. A community has to be lived out face to face with one another. How would you know whether you're rubbing each other the wrong way until you're with another person? You're talking to them, you're observing their body language, you're noticing the tone of their voice, you're, 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 you're looking at the responses of the people around. You make adjustments because you're able to see. And the Holy Spirit is teaching us, all again, myself included, because sometimes I love to stay at home, you know, but the Holy Spirit is teaching all of us today, you know, that we need to make room for Him. And sometimes to make room in our houses or rooms, we need to throw things away. And what's the Holy Spirit telling you to discard? It may be hurts, it may be unmet expectations, it may be bitterness, unforgiveness, our perceptions, our comfort level. As we begin to make room for Him, we need to begin to throw things away as well. And say that God, come as do as will. And we make room by letting the Holy Spirit remind us what Jesus has said. There will be moments when Jesus tells us something or maybe we hear a verse and we think that we remember, we act on it later. But when we begin to write it down, when we begin to act on it, the Holy Spirit reminds us. There are promises, dreams, desires, visions that Jesus has given to us. You know, and maybe we think that it's not going to come to pass. You think that, hey, your stage of life, God won't use you again. You think that I've done so many wrong things. God will not use me again. You think that, no, this doesn't make sense. God is not going to use me. However, when the Holy Spirit reminds us, the Holy Spirit is telling us, it's more than just what you think. It's what I'm saying. And the Holy Spirit is reminding us what Jesus' love looks like today as well. 
And church, I want to encourage us as we start our series to love one another. Uh, it's not only for some people to do, but it's for all of us here to do. Maybe you're comfortable with a certain way of doing. I want to respectfully ask that could you just let the Lord challenge you to step out and to see maybe He's asking you to do something different. Or maybe for some of us here, you feel like, hey, I tried before, no, Pastor. I, I led a cell group before. You know, I, I love people before, but they never returned the love. They never meet my expectations, you know. They hurt me. I've got no explanation for that. I, I'm sorry that they did. But you know what? I, I hope that you allow the Holy Spirit to bring the healing into your lives and to your hearts today. And let His love, the ultimate love, give you a renewed perspective, a fresh understanding. And as He has done it, you will do it as well. And so, when we talk about this love, the end goal is so that people will come to know Jesus. That's the core of the church. Not just a holy huddle, but a lamppost a light, a city on a hill, a light on a, on a hill, the, 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 the stand for that people will be drawn towards this light, towards Jesus as well. Amen. Let's stand to our feet today as we take time to respond to the Lord. You know, it's not, a, it's not an emotional thing. It is, it's not just an emotional thing, I'm sorry. It's not just an emotional thing, but it's a decision that we need to make today. And I ask the, the worship team to specially prepare this song called uh, Make Room, you know. And I want to encourage you if that's you today, you need the Lord to just speak to you, to do a work in you, or you're saying, God, I don't know how, but I want you. The altar is open, you know. Whether you're a leader or not, it doesn't matter. The altar is open. Come on to the front, respond to the Lord. You know, there are things that when we step out in this natural, it's equivalent to us stepping out in the supernatural as well. I'm not saying it's the most holy here. What I'm saying is our decision point, our decision will lead us to an action. And today as we talk about loving one another, won't you ask the Lord to give you more room for Him, more room for one another, more room for people who have not known Him to come into your life so that you can show them what truly is the love of Jesus. Amen. Amen. But before that, let's close our eyes. Let's just take a moment to reflect. Let's take a moment to reflect. Let's keep our let's close our eyes but keep our hearts on the Lord. Don't look around. Don't worry. Time is not running out. It's just you and God. Jesus. Jesus. Father, I just pray that you Lord, you will speak to us today. God, you you help us to really lay aside everything and put aside all just before you. God, we want to know what it means to have a fresh revelation of your love today. God, we want to know what it means to love one another. God, we want to know you. Lord, I pray that you just do a, a, a new work in our lives today. As we begin, oh God, to just seek your face. As we begin, oh God, to just give you room and give you space. Help us to surrender control. Help us to surrender to you that we don't just give you a part of our lives, we give you our lives because you've given it to us in the first place. Have your way. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So as the worship team leads us, you know, I just want to encourage you to just respond. Just come to the Lord and just say, God, I want to make room for you today. Amen. Burden every cloud. 
my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Church, I just sense that the, the Lord is speaking to some of us. You know, if, if you feel that the Lord is prompting you, I just want to encourage you to come to the front. You know, the Holy Spirit, God is everywhere, but His manifest presence is right here. You know, and so if you feel that the Holy Spirit is tugging your heart, you know, don't hold back. Let's just come to the front. Let's just respond to Him. You know, God wants to speak to us. God wants to meet us. You know, for leaders, if you're not responding, can I invite you to come and just stand with our members here this morning? Let's just continue to worship.
Whatever you 
Responding to the, uh, at the altar, would you just worship?
just thank you that you are a great God. We thank you for your love that has been deposited in us, in your church, Lord. God, we thank you for this community of believers, Lord, that you have deposited your love, Lord, the love that is not of convenience, not a love of, of emotions, Lord, but a love that, of choice that we choose to love, Lord. And so, God, we just pray for your church, Lord, that as we go out into the world, that we will be able to demonstrate your love, that we'll be carriers of your love, Lord, that we'll be trophies of what it means to love, Lord. So, God, we just pray for us, Lord, as we move out of here, Lord, that we'll, be, we'll begin to spread your love everywhere, Lord, that people outside will see the love that we have in this church, Lord that they will recognize that you are God. So God, we just thank you for this service today. We just thank you for your presence that is here. We pray that as we move from here, that you will continue to be with us, that you will continue to move, you will continue to speak and minister to us in a powerful way. Lord, that your church will be ready for what's next. So God, we just thank you. We give you all the praise and the glory that only you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you.